All right, so I said this at the beginning, I think, I think, but I'm not going to be here next week. So uh, there is no lecture in person and there is no quiz, but I will be uploading video lectures instead of one hour and a half chunk. I'm going to have a few like 10 to 20 minute, something like that section, so you can kind of break it up by topic. Although next week's lecture will be more of like a going deeper and doing examples rather than brand new material. Um, so hopefully those videos are an okay way to study. But again, no quiz next week. Then the week after that, you will have your final quiz. Um, yeah. So remember not to come here next week on Tuesday. All right. So, so far we've talked about linear momentum and forces. Um, starting with velocity. That was just our change in distance over a change in time. That's a vector, like the change in distance, because you know I can move five meters, but it's also important what direction I did that. I can move five meters left, right, up, down, whatever. And so that distance divided by the time that it takes to do that is my velocity. How far did I move in some given time? Linear translation, um, yeah. Momentum is just that velocity, how fast did I move, times my mass. The information that it adds is the inertia. I mean, momentum and inertia are kind of interchangeable, but it's how hard something is to get moving or to stop, or you know, when, when, when it's moving, um, I guess, when it interacts with objects is when this is important. Right? If I just had a single object moving through space, its velocity is probably the interesting part to us. But anytime it encounters another object, it's not just their velocities that matter, it's their masses too. Like we just saw in the quiz with a spaceship getting hit by the asteroid, um, the spaceship doesn't <laughs> change its motion nearly as much as the asteroid because it's a lot lighter. Um, but the velocity still comes into play. Anyway, that's a vector pointing in the same direction as the velocity, right? We just multiply by the mass, so if my change in position was this way to the left, and my, or my left, so that would be your right. If my change in position was to the right, then my change in velocity, or then my velocity was also to the right, and my momentum is also to the right. Um, momentum can also change, though. It doesn't have to be a constant. If we apply a force, which is another vector with some magnitude and a direction, over a time, then I get a change in velocity. And that can change its magnitude, um, it can completely flip it around, and it can change its direction as well. Right? I could be moving five meters per second and apply a force and still be moving five meters per second, but in a different direction. There's a whole bunch of things it can do. So hopefully this stuff is pretty solid for you by now, the linear momentum and forces. But now we're going to talk about rotation. So in addition to linear translations, we have things that spin and revolve. Um, and we can break those apart that motion apart from linear momentum and forces, very similarly to the way when we talk about linear, we can break up x and y, right? When we did linear, separate the components, we can solve the problem separately and put them back together. Very similar thing works here. Like let's say we just have a ball rolling down a hill. We know it has some linear motion, and we know how to describe that with its velocity and force and stuff like that. But it's also spinning, it's rolling, and it turns out that this Rotation has its own way of describing that motion, its own momentum associated, uh, momentum associated with it, um, its own energy, so on and so forth. And we can break those two things apart and, and solve them independently. But just like with the x and y components, there are ways in which it's helpful to separate them and then bring them back together um, just to get a more complete physical picture of a system. So let's look at the, moment, or the angular rotational analogs of all of our linear elements. Um, and I'll use the term rotational and angular a lot, like interchangeably. That's on purpose because they, we're talking about the same thing, spinning stuff. Um, so for velocity, instead of a change in distance or change in position or delta x over time, we have a change in angle, right? Angle is how we describe position when it comes to rotations, right? How, where, how many degrees from something? So instead of delta x, we have delta theta, right? Theta is this variable we've been using for angles, and delta theta is just a change in that angle over time. So we can describe how fast that angle is changing by putting delta theta over delta t, the same way we can do delta x over delta t for velocity. Um, and we call that angular velocity omega, or this curly, curly w. 
just like a little loopy w. Um, and that's also a vector. So we'll have to do some work to describe what that direction is. It's not immediately clear what it means to have a vector associated with an angle that's changing, but we'll work on that. For now, we know that um, it's our change in angle over our change in time. There's also an associated momentum with that velocity, right? How quickly an angle is changing, there's also like a rotational mass in the same way that, you know, something can be translating, have a linear velocity, and then its mass describes how hard it is to stop or speed it up or something. If we have this value i, it's rotational inertia that describes how hard it is to get something rotating or to stop it from rotating. It, however you think about mass, it works very similarly, except in this context of rotations, change in angle instead of change in positions. So we'll talk about how to calculate that i a bit later on, but for now we know it takes the place of mass. So if we multiply that times our velocity, so instead of mass times velocity, we have rotational mass times rotational velocity, or rotational inertia times rotational velocity, and we get this vector l. That's our angular momentum. So L is our new version of P. That's the momentum associated with a changing angle, something rotating. Um, and then finally, if we have an angular momentum, we better have something that can change our angular momentum, the analog of a force, right? If I have P, I change that P, get a delta P by applying a net force over a time. Very similar thing, if I change my angular momentum, I do so using something called a torque. So a torque is like an angular force. It changes the angular momentum of something when applied over a time. Um, so all these equations look and they actually function in a very similar way to our linear momentum and forces. Um, we'll just have to do a little work to yeah, figure out how to exactly describe systems within this context. Uh, there's a couple more like complexities that come into play. Um, but like you can see, the structure is very similar. So let's step back to the first piece, which is describing just our angles, our delta theta. Um, I put this up here more of a reference if you're just going through the slides, but we know 360 degrees goes around a complete circle. That's one full rotation or revolution. And 2 pi is equal to 360 degrees in radians. For this unit, let's use radians because radians are actually unitless. Um, so when we do calculations with radians and like angle per second and stuff, you don't, yeah, radians are the preferred way. If we use degrees, we'd have to do some unit conversion to get from degrees to radians to get a more useful answer. Um, you can kind of see it in practice later on, but as long as you understand that two pi is all the way around, so 360 degrees, pi is 180, pi over four, or sorry, pi over two is 90 degrees, so on and so forth. Um, yeah, I would get comfortable with that if you haven't already, and be sure you switch your calculator settings um, when you are solving problems. So that's how we describe angle, with just the angle, the radian, the amount of radians. Um, how do we describe the direction of it, right? Because we wrote theta, delta theta as a vector, right? Because we, we know things can rotate in a bunch of different ways. Like me, I can rotate this way, I could rotate that way, I could do a cartwheel towards you or away. Um, and we want to be able to describe that. So let's think about how we might do it. What's one way that we describe rotations a lot just when we're talking to each other? Well, clockwise and counterclockwise, right? We all know if we look at this like clock up here, if I say clockwise or counterclockwise, we all know what I'm talking about. We would say that's the same direction. However, someone that was standing on the other side of this door, assuming they could see through the wall, like clockwise and counterclockwise would be reversed. So it actually depends on where you're sitting. So like to, to illustrate that, if I move my hand like this, to me, this is going clockwise. But what direction would you describe this hand as moving from your perspective? Right, so that's no good for at least something where we're trying to do a physics problem because if you do your problem sitting in your seat and I, I don't know, that doesn't really work like that, but you know, you turn it in, someone else observing it from a different angle has a different answer. So that's, that's not good. Um, what about left, right, up, down? Like what if we pick a point on something that's rotating and say whatever direction that point is moving, we'll say that's di the direction that that's spinning. So like this chair, what if I say whatever direction this arm is moving is the direction that I'm gonna assign to the rotation. That's no good too, because up here it's moving this way, 
to the right, now it's moving toward me, now it's moving to the left, now it's moving away from, like, that's always changing. And that's true for any point that I pick on the object, right, except for the center, which is not moving at all. So that's not really a good way to describe something either. Changes depending on where you're observing from and which point you pick. So the thing that we end up using is the axis perpendicular to the rotation. So we're getting the right hand rule is the thing we use in physics to describe this. Um, so it turns, so yeah, basically whichever way something's rotating, perpendicular to the plane of rotation is the new axis we're going to use to describe it. Um, sounds kind of weird, but I mean this picture I think shows it pretty well. We have a disc that's rotating from our perspective, it looks like counterclockwise, right? And we use the direction that's up and down or perpendicular so that it's rotating like flat and we're using the up and down to describe its motion. Um, we'll see in a sec that it does not change depending on where we're sitting. But also it gives us a clear way to describe like one direction of rotation and the other, counterclockwise and clockwise if we were using that other system because we can go up or down, right? There's a clear positive and negative for the rotation. Um, so the way the right hand rule works is we take our right hand and I still make this mistake, I promise you all make this mistake one day you're holding a pencil or whatever if you're a righty and you'll use your left hand but it only works for your right hand and you curl your fingers in the direction of the rotation. So for this disc here, if it's rotating like flat in the board, we wrap our fingers in the direction that it's rotating like and that's compared to the axis so it helps to like imagine your like fist at the center, like where it's rotating, curl your fingers and we get up, like we see here. So we would describe this direction of angular velocity as, or changing angle as up. If I was this chair, take this and put it in the front, this won't be great for the video lecture, but if I spin it here, if I wrap my fingers in the direction of the rotation, like this, I get down. And all you should try that too. And what direction do you get if you take your right hand and curl your fingers in the direction of rotation, it should also be down. Um, this can get a little bit tricky at first, like especially if you're like you're sitting far away for something or it's at a weird angle, you're, you'll catch yourself like trying to contort your body to get it to match up. If you're doing that, there's probably an easier way to get your fist to line up with it, but you should be able to find a way and get used to it. Um, also, anytime I show something today on the board that's rotating, I encourage you to just kind of practice the right hand rule real quick, as we will on the next slide. Um, but it's good to get confident knowing up, down, right, left. And we have this new notation here, into the page and out of the page. I mean, it's, we often describe it as like the Z axis, right? If X and Y are horizontal and vertical on the page, we could say Z is coming into and out. But for this class, we'll just use these two new symbols for into the page and out of the page. So if I wanted a vector into the page, as you'll see on the next slide, I would just write the magnitude of it and then put this little symbol next to it to describe the direction. Um, one way I've heard to, or that I was taught to remember this is like if you think of an arrow traveling away from you or into the page, you'd see the feathers, like a little cross in the circle, and if it was coming toward you, out of the page, you would just see a dot for the tip. Um, but either way, that's the symbol we use. Um, and we use all these things to describe all of the angular vectors that we're about to talk about. The, uh, the angle vector, the angular velocity vector, the angular momentum, the torque, whatever, we need a way to describe the direction and for all of them, it will be this method. So let's practice it. Um, click your question, if this car is moving forward, so the way it's drawn on this page, which direction do the angular velocity vectors of the wheels point? So each individual wheel has some angular velocity. What direction should that vector be pointing? Even if you don't have a clicker or anything, I encourage you to just practice this. It'll be really helpful later on. Give you about 15 more seconds with this one. All right, I'm gonna call it there. So everyone said, mostly everyone, which is okay, we're just learned this, said D or E. And that 
we know is correct that it's either one of those because those are the two that are perpendicular to the plane of rotation. So if we think all four of these wheels are rotating kind of like in the board, right, in what we would call x and y, so the direction that we assign to it, whether it's in or out of the board, is going to be one of those. It's perpendicular, like the direction of the axle of the car that's poking through the center of the wheel. Um, so it's either in or out. And then, which direction are these wheels rotating if the car is moving forward? Well, the way these arrows are oriented here. So if we align our, take our right hand and align our fingers with any of these arrows, either going along the top of the wheel, we get into the page, we go along the bottom of the wheel, it looks a little different, but it's still into the page, and that's an example of how it might be easier to, like, when I was standing like this, I had to like go like that, but if I was like this, either way, it gives you the right answer, but there are easier and harder ways to orient your right hand rule. Anyway, the answer for all four of these wheels when the car is moving forward in this direction is going to be into the page. Um, okay, great. So now we know how to describe angular vectors. Um, so let's go back to angular velocity. So our delta theta is just the direction that the angle is changing, and this omega, our angular velocity, is how fast it's changing. So that change in angle over a change in time. And since delta t is just a scalar, right, it's just a number, it doesn't change the direction. So whatever direction our angle is changing, the direction of my delta theta, so in this case, this angle here is opening up, theta is increasing, there's my delta theta, and the speed at which it's changing is omega. And both of those in this case, if we wrap our fingers with the direction of that change in angle, are out of the page, as we can see this little dot in the circle. So theta and omega uh, point out of the page. Um, and the units of theta are radians, like I said, unitless, and the angle, and sorry, the units of angular velocity, or omega, are just inverse seconds. So we found before that the units of linear velocity were meters per second, right? How many meters do I go in how many seconds? In this case, it's how many radians do I go in how many seconds, but like I said, radians are unitless, so it's just one over seconds, or inverse seconds, um, and that's very useful. Otherwise, we would, when we were doing calculations and stuff, we, if we used degrees, we would just have factors of degrees in there, um, and we don't want that. We want the angle to disappear. So again, just use radians. So let's do a practice problem calculating angular velocity. Um, let's take a look at a clock. And I didn't specify here, but I mean the hour hand. What is the angular velocity for the hour hand on an analog clock? So we know it takes 12 hours for it to do one complete rotation. Right? So what is its angular velocity in inverse seconds? So we said omega is delta theta over delta t. We know delta t is 12 hours. Even if you don't have a calculator, I recommend at least like kind of writing out or thinking through what you would do to calculate this. What is the change in angle over the change in time, or the angular velocity? Give you about 30 more seconds with this one. All right, I'm gonna stop us there. If you didn't finish, don't worry. So, we know that, well, the answer is A, but let's walk through it. 
our angular velocity, or this omega vector, is our change in angle over change in time. So our change in angle, well, we know it takes one hour, like we said, take, or sorry, it takes 12 hours to go through one complete rotation. So for one complete rotation, our change in angle is 2 pi, right, 360 degrees all the way around, and our delta t is 12 hours. But I asked for it in inverse seconds, so we got to convert this 12 hours to seconds. So 12 hours times 60 minutes per hour times 60 seconds per minute, and we get 0 0.000145 seconds. So uh, seconds inverse and into the page. So very slow, obviously, right? We can't even, if we just stare at the clock, we can't even see it moving. Um, but yeah, this is just an exercise in, in applying this concept of what delta theta over delta t is, and then assigning the direction. If we look at this clock here, we know that our hand goes from our perspective looking at the page clockwise, but that's not a great way to describe it because it wouldn't be the same for people behind the board. So we wrap our fingers in the direction going around the clock clockwise, and we get into the page. So that's why all of these vectors are that little cross in a circle. Okay. So now we have angular velocity down, right? Change in angle over change in time. We know how to describe the direction, but if we want to describe its motion more completely, especially when it comes to different rotating things interacting, we need a momentum, an angular momentum, um, which involves its rotational mass or uh, rotational inertia. So that's where we get this value L. L is our angular momentum. That's our new value for P, right? And it's our angular velocity, omega times i, or our rotational mass. Um, and it just tells us how hard it is to start or stop something from rotating, right? So something with a really high uh, rotational inertia is going to be hard to rotate. And if it's rotating, hard to stop. And something with a small one will be the opposite. Um, this i is also often called the moment of inertia, um, rotational inertia, moment of inertia. Uh, they're both the same thing. Um, so yeah, I mean, more classic physics textbooks usually use moment of inertia, so you might see that more outside of this course. Anyway, we just multiply them together to get our angular momentum. The faster something is moving, the more angular momentum. The higher rotational inertia or rotational mass, the more angular momentum. Very similar intuitive piece to linear momentum. Um, and it describes the rotational motion, and like I said, now, L is just added to this list that also points out of the page. So now, I, same diagram as before, I've, where we have this angle opening up out of the page, and I've assigned it some, we don't know how to calculate it yet, but if I just say it's rotational inertia is I, then I times a vector that's pointing out of the page is also another vector that's pointing out of the page. So this would be the analog to you know, say in the linear case, something that's moving to the right has a delta x to the right, a momentum to the right, um, and a velocity to the right. Um, so how do we calculate this i? How do we get our rotational mass? What determines how hard it is to rotate something? Um, so we have this kind of nasty looking formula here. I think anything with a big sigma in it is nasty, but we're summing over the mass elements. Uh, before we look at the equation, though, let's just think about conceptually what matters. Um, so M is a mass element, so something how heavy the object is does matter. And R is the distance of a mass element from the axis of rotation, from where it's rotating. So not only does the mass of an object matter, but the configuration of it. If we think of the mass elements as just the pieces of something, or like a, a bunch of atoms, right? Their configuration and how far they are away from wherever we're rotating this object about um, matters a lot. So it's not only the object mass, but also its geometry, how it's configured. Um, so we could have two things that weigh the exact same, have the same mass, but one has a much higher rotational inertia. Or one's much harder to rotate because of how it's configured. Um, it also depends on the axis of rotation, right? If we're defining this r as the distance from the axis of rotation, I could have the same object, but if I rotate it about a different part or a different point in space, those R values for each piece of it are going to change. And as we'll see later on, like if I take something like a dumbbell, like you know, a bar with two weights on the end, rotating it from the center is much different in difficulty than rotating it from like an end. So we'll see that coming up. Uh, 
but in the end, you sum up over each mass element. So let's do some practice examples. In this case, we just have like a pendulum-like setup. There's a single mass, m, that's connected by a length, like a string, r, that's swinging under here. So it's rotating this way. The direction of this motion, just for practice, would be into the page, right? If we curl our fingers with the direction of the swinging around that center point into the page, and let's find its rotational inertia. Well, we just have one piece, so the sum is just that one piece, and it's m, <laughs> the mass of this mass element, times r squared, the distance of that mass element. So this one's easy, and it looks just like the formula. What if we add a mass that's 2m? That's also a distance r, rotating in the same way. Well, in that case, the mass element is 2m, and the distance is still r, so it'd be 2m r squared. What if, though, we had a mass that's m, and it's a distance 2r away from the center? Now, the m is just m, but the r that we would plug in is 2r. So this one would actually be 4m times r squared. So now we see a kind of some like pattern emerging. If I doubled the mass of this mass element, it just doubled the rotational inertia. It made it twice as hard to rotate. But if I doubled the distance that this mass element was from the axis of rotation, I made it four times as difficult to rotate. And that's a product of the fact that we have an m, but an r squared in the equation for the moment of inertia. So the distance actually comes into play more importantly than the mass. So moment of inertia is super sensitive to how far away things are from the point that you're rotating around. So let's take a look at an object like this. Now we have two elements. We have two masses, each m, that's, that are, we're rotating around the center. So this is like a dumbbell spinning in a circle from the center. Each is a distance r over 2 from that center point. And we have to sum over both. So the sum is just you know add up the mr squared for each piece. Each one is m times r over 2 squared. And since it's squared, we only care about the distance. right? It doesn't matter that this one is one way and this one's the other. If those were vectors, they would be opposite. Like one would be positive, one would be negative. But in this case, it's squared, so we only care about the physical distance. Um, so we get m times r over 2 squared plus m times r over 2 squared plus the other one, which is equal to m r squared over 2. So there's one thing. Already we've learned something interesting that this object has weighs a total of 2m, right? But it actually has half the moment of inertia as the object that only had a single m that was r away. So I'm, I'm saying a lot without showing any pictures, but um, if we accept this is the moment of inertia for this setup, what if I move the axis of rotation? So now same object, but instead of rotating it around the center, I rotate it around one of the ends. So now I put the rotation point in the middle of one of the masses. Now, do the same calculation, except one of the masses now has a distance of zero from the axis of rotation, right? We're rotating it around that mass, so it has no, there's no distance between that and the rotation point. And the other one now has a distance of two times r over two, or a total of r away. So the moment of inertia of this setup is mr squared. So same object. But depending on where we had the axis of rotation, we could go mr squared over 2 or mr, or MR squared. So it really does matter. <laughs> I skipped over everything I wanted to see there. But it really does matter where we put the axis of rotation. Um, so we found geometry of the object, so how it's set up, and the mass of all those pieces of it which could be very discrete, like in the case of the dumbbell, where it's like one mass over here, one mass over there. Or it could be one continuous object that we have to integrate over, which we won't do in this class. But an integral from calculus is just a sum of a bunch of infinitely small pieces. Um, but anyway, in most cases, I will just give you the moment of inertia of an object, like of a disk, or a wheel, or a sphere, or something like that. Um, you'll only have to calculate it for very simple examples, like the case of a dumbbell with a couple pieces. Um, so yeah, not too much complicated math there. But now we have rotational inertia. We have angular velocity. So let's do some practice with calculating the angular momentum of something. In particular, let's calculate the angular momentum of the Earth going around the sun. 
Um, so this you know, big astrophysical thing that's happening, we can actually get pretty close to the right answer, even though the Earth is not orbiting in a perfect circle. And you know, not a lot of that matters. As long as we know um, just a few key ingredients, we can actually calculate this. Uh, so I just Googled these numbers and rounded a little bit. The Earth is a distance of 1.5 times 10 to the 11th meters away from the sun. So really far, but we have our R. And it has a mass of 6 times 10 to the 24th kilograms, so also pretty huge. But this gives us our M, R, or sorry, our M and our R, so we can calculate the moment of inertia, right? how difficult it is to rotate the Earth about an axis that is this far away. And then we also know how long it takes to go around the circle. right? So we can figure out its angular velocity, because we know it takes a year for the Earth to go all the way around the sun. And a year is about 3 times 10 to the 7th second. Um, the last piece of information, if we want the direction, is if you look down from like the north pole of the Earth at the solar system, um, the Earth is moving counterclockwise. So we know counterclockwise, if we take our hand, assuming we're, I mean, even though the picture doesn't show this, assuming we're looking uh, top down, the rotation of the Earth counterclockwise would give us out of the page, right? So let's proceed with the calculation. We know angular momentum, which is what we're after, is our moment of inertia, or our rotational inertia, times our angular velocity. So let's calculate our rotational inertia. We just have one piece, which is the Earth. <clears throat> so we just need the mr squared of the Earth. m is, like I said, 6 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. r is 1 and a half times 10 to the 11th meters. Square that, and we get this value with kind of funky units, but 1.35 times 10 to the 47th kilogram meter squared. That's the rotational inertia of the Earth, but that's, it's the rotational, of the rotational inertia of the Earth revolving around the sun. Right? If we were calculating this value for the Earth spinning around its axis, that would be a whole different thing. Because now we have a different axis of, a rota of rotation. The distance that all the mass elements of Earth are away from that is very different. Here, we're just thinking about one point in space as the center, as the axis of rotation, and the Earth spinning around that. So it is very important what axis you're talking about when you calculate this I. Um, OK, so now angular velocity. Like we said, our delta theta is 2 pi, right? We just once around the sun, uh, 360 degrees. And that's going to be out of the page, because from top down, it's moving counterclockwise. So out of the page, and our delta t is just a year, which is this many seconds, and uh, that comes out to 2.09 times 10 to the negative seventh inverse seconds um, is our angular velocity. So now, if we want the angular momentum, we just multiply these two things together, and we find that our angular momentum is 2.8 times 10 to the 40th kilograms meters squared per second. So again, kind of funky units for now, but the value itself is useful. It tells us basically how difficult the Earth would be to stop, or like how much rotational momentum it carries as it goes around the sun. This number is massive. You probably will not encounter this numbers of this size on any assessment, but it's fun to be able to do such a large scale calculation with very simple physical concepts. Um, just to, as a heads up, like I won't give you scientific notation like times 10 to the whatever on quizzes and tests and stuff. It's just annoying, but um, just used it for this example. All right, so now we have angles, angular velocity, angular momentum. Now let's talk about changing angular momentum. So to change angular momentum, we need a torque. Again, same concept about like constant and changing. If there's no net torque, our angular momentum is constant. Not necessarily zero. Something can be rotating with no net torque, but that rotation will not be changing. If we want to speed it up, slow it down, or change the direction of the rotation, then we do need a torque. And the way that torque affects it is very similar to the way force affects momentum. We just multiply that vector by a delta t. And the way the directions are in that the change in angular momentum is in the same direction as the net torque, it just means that if I apply a torque into the page, then my angular momentum, momentum is going to change into the page. 
Um, that doesn't mean my initial or final will be into the page, but the change will be that way. Um, okay, so how do we get from a force to a torque? And I guess I'm giving away there that a torque does get generated by a force. Those two are related. Um, how do we know? Well, if I want to rotate this chair, what do I do? Well, I push on it, push on a certain piece of it in a certain way. But me doing this to a chair, like we know that if I take my hand and push on something, that produces a force. We know somehow it's also producing a torque because I am giving this chair angular momentum. Um, but how does this force relate to a torque? And it turns out that not just the magnitude and direction, so I mean, those are all the components of what makes a force. It's where it is and how strong it is, but also where the force is being applied is very important, right? If I take this chair and I push over here on one arm, it rotates one way, but if I take the chair and I push over here on the other arm, it rotates the other way. And there's a lot of different ways I could push on this chair and a lot of different things that would happen um, as far as how fast it rotates, what direction it rotates. So the force and the location of where I'm putting the force both matter. Let's see how. Well, drawn here I have a bunch of the same object, just some hoop or disc with a radius r that's affixed in the center so it just can spin around and I apply all these forces to it. Which of these is actually going to make this wheel or disc rotate? How about this first one? If I, like imagine this was a bike wheel, if I applied a force like that, is it gonna rotate? Yeah. How about this other one? The force is in a different area, but is that gonna rotate if I just go like that across a bike wheel? Yeah, that'll cause it to spin. How about this next one? What if I like push up on one of the spokes? Is that gonna cause it to rotate? Nope. For this last one, what if I like pull upward? We got a bike wheel just like pulled on a wheel. Is that gonna cause it to rotate? No. So clearly, all of these forces have the same magnitude. Um, and actually, these second two have the same direction also as this first one that we know does, in fact, cause a change in angular momentum or cause the wheel to rotate. So the location or where the force is applied definitely makes a difference. And exactly how is by multiplying it by the distance from the axis of rotation. So this r, this distance, just described how far away the force is from the axis of rotation. So it's very easy to see here when it's just like a wheel rotating around the center. If I apply a force directly perpendicular to it, then I have that force multiplied by the radius or the distance from the center of the wheel to where I'm applying the force. Also here, no, it's not to the end of the force. The force is acting at the start of the vector. The length of the vector just tells me how strong the force is. But if I draw the force with the vector starting here, that's where the force is acting. So it depends on the distance, r, to the force. If we so you see here, torque is f perpendicular times r. I'll talk about the perpendicular in a second. But um, if r is bigger, torque is going to be bigger. Right? If we increase r, torque goes up. Same thing with force. Stronger force with the same r means a stronger torque. So how do we see that? Well. I mean, I'll, we can try it with this chair, but like visualize with a bike wheel, and you can try this yourself. If I take my wheel and I try to rotate it by pushing on the outside, like right near the edge on a spoke, push down on a spoke, it's gonna rotate. Be pretty easy to. So that's some r, that's about the radius of the wheel. Now, try that same thing very close to the center of the wheel. Push down on a spoke, really close to the center. It's gonna be much harder. The wheel's gonna rotate a lot less with the same amount of force. It's much, much more difficult because that r, the distance from the center, the axis of rotation, is much smaller, right? So we imagine with this chair, I mean, it's not really the best way to do this example, but if I push on the arm, it rotates some amount, but if I push like somewhere closer to the center, it's much harder to rotate. Yeah, this is really a terrible demonstration piece. But the further away you are from the axis of rotation, the more bang you get for your buck. The more the force, the more torque the same force creates. Um, so R is the distance from the center to that force application. Now the perpendicular piece, what does that mean? Well, like we saw before, with those bunch of forces lined up, 
these two created a force, the first two on the left, or sorry, created a rotation, but these two on the right did not cause the wheel to rotate. The difference between them was that these forces are perpendicular to this R. R you can think of as like the vector that points from the center to the force, right? Just an arrow going from center of rotation to the force. R and F are perpendicular in these first two examples on the left, but on the right, they're parallel. Here, I mean, F is right on top of R, and here, F and R are clearly parallel, and they do nothing. So it turns out that only the piece of F that is perpendicular to R causes a rotation. So here, all of F is already perpendicular. So the whole F is just what we call F perpendicular. Um, if F is parallel to it, F doesn't have to be zero, right? My vector F is clearly not zero. It's the same magnitude, but the perpendicular piece, F perpendicular on this example on the right is zero because none of this force is perpendicular to R or the vector from the center of the rotation to the force. So these are the two extremes where all of the F contributes to the force and none of the F contributes to the force. But there can be examples where it's somewhere in between. So what if we apply a force that's kind of diagonal to it, right? This force, just like before when we broke vectors into an x direction and a y direction, we can break them up into any two directions. So in this case, it is x and y. But the important thing to notice is that this piece of f is parallel to the r, the position, and has no effect on the rotation, right? Remember, if we just pulled on a wheel in the direction of a spoke, nothing happens. And this component of F, the perpendicular piece, is the one that does contribute to the rotation. So here's our total F, our whole magnitude, but only the component perpendicular to R is the piece that contributes to the rotation. And the way we find it, same old like trig. For this case, the F perpendicular is the opposite side, so it would be the magnitude times sine of the angle theta that I've given. Um, on the bottom, I wrote cos. Just forgot to change that here when I was writing the example. But um, I would strongly, strongly urge you not to memorize, like, torque is fr cos theta, or torque is fr sine theta. Because just like with the collision problems, you don't, like, you can define theta a whole bunch of ways, right? If I gave you theta as this angle with the force and the vertical, then it would be cos instead of sine, right? So don't memorize what this trig function is. Just know that you need to find the piece of the force that is perpendicular to R. Um, that's something that comes with practice. Um, and it also turns out <laughs> that you can also find the piece of R that's perpendicular to F. Those things are mathematically equivalent. So let's take a look at a different example. Now we just have this plank that's a length of R and we're applying some force to the end of it to get it to rotate. So it's gonna rotate here. Right hand rule practice, it's gonna rotate this way, or kinda clockwise if we're looking at the page, but into the page is the way we would describe the torque, the angular momentum that results, the angular velocity. But here the force and the position vector, this r, are not perpendicular, right? They, part of f is parallel, part of it's perpendicular. But in this case, F is already easy, F is already up and down, right? It's just a Y component, it's a very easy force to look at. So let's not mess that up. Let's, let's not break F into weird coordinates that are like one piece along R and one piece perpendicular. We can do that, and we will, annoyingly, but it's actually much easier in this case just to calculate the R perpendicular. So same type of thing, I have, if I've given some angle theta, in this case, it's R cos theta for the perpendicular piece, right? But R, some vector, can be broken into a parallel. See, R parallel here is parallel to F. They're both pointing down. And R perpendicular is perpendicular to F. And if we do that, the expression we get for torque is very similar. It's just FR times some trig function, right? Magnitude of F times the magnitude of R is some like maximum value if they were perfect, perfectly perpendicular. And then cosine, sine, whatever trig functions are 
less than one, the result. So this reduces it, basically. It's by saying they're not completely perpendicular, so how much of them is perpendicular is really what that trig function is saying. So either way, whether you do tau is f perpendicular times r, or f times r perpendicular, those two are mathematically equivalent, but you just pick one. You don't need to find, like, you don't need two trig functions in there. Um, just find the piece of f that's perpendicular to r and multiply them together, or the piece of r that's perpendicular to f and multiply those together. They are the same exact thing. But again, at the end of the day, you just care about the pieces that are perpendicular because the ones that are parallel do not cause any rotation. So they're not going to contribute to torque. They will con still contribute to force. It doesn't mean that, in this case, this, the piece of F that's parallel to R doesn't do anything. It still pulls on it, right? There's still a physical consequence, um, as we'll see in problems next week, but it does not cause a rotation. So to sum this up, um, angular velocity is just our change in angle over time, and its direction is determined by the right-hand rule. Um, this is so tiny in the lower right-hand corner because there's a lot more text that's going to pop up, um, but it's much bigger in an earlier slide. So angular velocity, how fast and what direction the object is, is rotating. Angular momentum is how hard it is to stop or start something from rotating, and it depends not only on the angular velocity that it has, but also its rotational inertia, which we found out depends on the mass and the geometry of the object, as well as what axis you're rotating it around. And then we have this change in angular momentum, um, which can be changed by applying a torque over a time. And torques are produced by forces that are some distance away from the center, uh, from the center of the axis of rotation. And we care only about the piece of the force that is perpendicular from the position vector, which sounds like a mouthful, but when you draw these out, it hopefully will be a little more clear. Doing this F R perpendicular and F perpendicular R will be a lot of the focus of the next week or so. Um, just takes a lot of practice. It is pretty tricky at first, I won't lie, um, but I think it's really important. And it, the concept, the root concept is the same as breaking forces down into like an X and a Y. It's just X and Y, we, not arbitrarily, we did it because it's how we think, but there's no difference between defining your coordinates as up and down versus like, a little to the right, you know, like this or whatever. We can rotate that however we want. As long as we pick two coordinate directions that are perpendicular to each other, perpendicular and parallel in this case, then we can describe a vector. So you'll play around with that. Next week, my lecture videos that I upload will do a lot of this. Um, today I prefaced a lot of angular momentum and talked about the dynamics and even hinted at like things where rotation, rotating objects are interacting. However, Going to DL, you're going to take a step back, and the first thing we're going to look at, like I said, is torques. So just looking at problems where there's not even any rotation, where the torques are completely balanced, but you're going to practice figuring out that balance. What force do I need where and in what direction in order to have a balanced system? And then once we complete looking at static systems, balanced forces, balanced torques, then we'll move on to systems where there is a change in angular momentum, and we'll draw angular momentum charts. Lots of good stuff like that to look forward to. Um, but this will be our jumping off point, is figuring out how to calculate torques. And that's all I have for today. Have a good rest of your week. Remember, no lecture next week. Just videos, no lecture, no quiz.